All right, chapter 38 is uh, <laughs> certainly a chapter near and dear to my heart, geriatrics, as I uh, <laughs> every year advance closer to that uh, demographic. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. The uh, geriatric population deserves uh, special attention, not just because we've always been taught to respect our elders, but uh, because aging poses um, unique challenges uh, to both your assessment and treatment of the uh, geriatric patient. Uh, the elderly patients often have very subtle presentations, uh, even though they possess life-threatening diseases uh, because of their uh, indifference to pain and, and um, uh, perhaps other psychological or social reasons why they try to downplay the seriousness of their illness. Um, their complaints are often very vague. Uh, dizziness. Uh, shortness of breath, chest discomfort, those sort of things. 34% uh, of all EMS calls are for older people. And when we talk about the geriatric population, we're talking about those over the age of 65. And uh, right now, it's estimated that one in every eight people is over the age of 65. But by 2030, which is fast approaching, one in every four people will be over the age of 65 as the baby boomers uh, reach that uh, age group, and that will continue for a decade or so. Uh, and uh, as we know, the older you get, certainly uh, the more health care you consume, and uh, as uh, our, our baby boomers get older and our uh, elder population um, um, expands, uh, it'll put an ever-increasing uh, demand on our health care system. Uh, there are some uh, social issues faced with the aged, and that includes ageism. Uh, and ageism is a belief that because you're old, uh, you're frail. Uh, you're less capable of learning. You're less capable of uh, doing this, that, or the other thing. And that's a, that's a true misnomer. Because uh, as we'll discuss, although a person may slow down when they're uh, older, and we may have to allow them uh, more time to answer questions. Uh, being old uh, doesn't mean that uh, you're any less capable compared to your younger counterparts, uh, especially when it comes to learning new things. Um, the living situations, um, you know, as a person gets older, uh, especially if they're by themselves, especially if they be, uh, become a, a person who needs uh, help with activities of daily living, um, then they may um, they may need uh, uh, care from a, a family member uh, or may be moved out of their home into a long-term care facility or an independent living facility, um, you know, those sort of things. I think what's interesting is, is that, you know, well over 80% of all um, elder patients still live in their own homes. Uh, and why we think, while we might think that with this aging population there'll be a need for more nursing homes, um, people are actually taking better care of themselves, and uh, while they're getting older, uh, they're getting older healthier. Um, their financial ins uh, situation may also uh, pose an issue with the aged. Uh, they are maybe on a fixed income. Uh, their financial future may be uncertain. Uh, again, with uh, longer life expectancies, and escalating medical costs and the need for long-term care are all things that need to be con considered here in the next uh, several decades. Uh, also, when we age, we certainly have to deal with end-of-life decisions, and that may include advanced directives. Um, now, advanced directives are something that a, a person may um, execute uh, prior to needing a decision about the health care that they receive. Uh, they can also appoint a durable power of attorney to make those decisions for them, uh, but an advanced directive is not a DNR. Advanced directives include things like living wills, and a living will uh, provides specific instructions to health care providers about the patient's wishes for the type of health care measures that should be done to prolong their life, but it clearly says in a living will if their condition is terminal. And we're just not able to make that decision. Uh, a physician would be able to make their decision. So living wills deal with that person who's been told they have a terminal illness uh, and that their condition is terminal and that 
uh, at some point uh, they may need to be resuscitated and what do they want to do about that that sort of thing uh, if there is no written proof otherwise uh, we have to uh, treat um, uh, all patients uh, uh, with um, proper medical care um, even if they say well um, I have a living will or I have an advanced directive again if it's not signed by a physician and the patient or the durable power attorney of the patient uh, it really doesn't hold a lot of water for EMS we prefer do not resuscitate orders uh, a DNR is an advanced directive but it's a different type because uh, the person just flat out states uh, should my heart stop I don't want to have CPR done or I don't want to have resuscitation measures uh, implemented and as long as they're of their right mind or they have appointed a durable power of a medical attorney to make those decisions for them then um, we would have to honor that if we had a written proof uh, present um, if you're ever in doubt of whether or not you, you should resuscitate a person um, then do resuscitate them uh, treat the patient uh, as you would uh, any other patient uh, because it's a it's an easier defense to defend uh, you know if you arrive on scene and you have a family member who says well don't do anything uh, but they have no DNR and you don't do anything and uh, later they find out there was no DNR and other members of the family want to know why you were there uh, you didn't resuscitate them uh, you could be uh, you know you could be um, in a lot of legal trouble uh, whereas if they do have a DNR but they can't produce it and uh, you do resuscitate them uh, you know they may be angry at you for uh, not abiding by the wishes but they you know they should be able to uh, prove that that's what the patient wanted and it's not likely you're going to end up in court for doing something right uh, what's in the best interest of the patient <clears throat> so if there's in doubt resuscitate uh, we'll talk about the pathophysiology of aging and how it affects the body. The body goes through many natural changes as we age um, and as a result causes uh, altered function of most of our body systems. And uh, we do know that different people age at different rates depending on their lifestyle uh, uh, choices. Um, we'll talk about you know each of these uh, things that affect uh, the body as we age uh, in detail things like you know graying and loss of hair um, reduction in the eyes ability to focus so they may need glasses uh, diminished hearing so they may need hearing aid a decrease in uh, basal metabolic rate so weight gain can be common uh, reduction in resting cardiac output so if they need to stress themselves uh, it may be difficult and the reduction in resting cardiac output leads to things like um, positional um, uh, hypotension where if they stand up quick they may get lightheaded and dizzy um, an increase in blood pressure as the vessels become uh, more narrow and hardened uh, and don't uh, dilate like they should um, reduction in skin elasticity causing wrinkles and sagging uh, slower reflexes uh, bones become thinner easier to break um, diminished ability to maintain balance so falls are common and falls are the number one cause of death in the elderly patient uh, the development of uh, osteoarthritis um, reduction in uh, gut size uh, so it becomes difficult to process food so uh, gut motility uh, usually slows down constipation is more common um, decrease in kidney mass and liver weight so those two organs don't function as well and as a result if they're taking medications we'll see that they can have a buildup in those meds a reduction in height uh, all those things are, are common uh, pathophysiologies uh, changes that we see with aging now when we talk about pharmacology in the elderly patient uh, elderly patients account for 30 percent of all prescriptions 11% of the ED visits are due to a condition that's called polypharmacy, and we'll talk about that later. Um, the most frequent adverse reactions associated with medications taken by the elderly include confusion, sedation, loss of balance, change in bowel or urinary patterns, nausea, or electrolyte abnormalities. 
Um, some common adverse drug effects and their clinical outcomes uh, include, uh, you know, many elder patients may be on anti-inflammatory agents, uh, but we do know that they cause ulcers, blood loss, and they are, ne they are um, nephrotoxic or they're really hard on the kidneys. Um, the clinical outcomes associated with anti-inflammatory agents, if you take them long enough, certainly is the potential for hemorrhage, the development of anemia, uh, sodium retention, and perhaps acute renal failure. With amino glycosides, uh, they are um, uh, nephrotoxic as well, so they're really hard on the kidneys. Um, and uh, if the kidneys aren't working uh, properly, you can get an increase in serum concentration of uh, any of the meds that you take. So you can become toxic on your medications because you're not eliminating them through, uh, through the kidneys as you normally would. Anticholinergics, remember the cholinergic nervous system is the fight or the um, feed or breed, rest and digest nervous system. Uh, it's the thing that uh, you know keeps you wet and moist and keeps things moving. Um, anticholinergic drugs, uh, particularly things like Spireva that help you breathe better, um, Benadryl, uh, d uh, Dramamine, you know, things like that that they may be on uh, because of dizziness. Um, they lead to dry mouth, constipation, decrease in bladder tone, uh, orthostatic hypotension, and they do make you tired. As a result, it can lead to confusion, uh, instability, and falls. And again, falls are the number one cause of death in the elder population. Some anticoagulants, of course, the adverse drug uh, effects are uh, hemorrhage. And of course, the clinical outcomes would be uh, hemorrhage and uh, shock. Uh, antidepressants, uh, they have anticholinergic effects, and they also cause heart blocks. Uh, so, as an anticholinergic, they can have the same effects of uh, confusion, urinary retention, falling, um, acute renal failure, you know, those sort of things. Uh, antipsychotics uh, have the adverse drug of, uh, effects of sedation. Um, they can have dystonias or dyskinesias, uh, which are uh, relate to uh, muscle tremors or jerking, uh, and then uh, hypotension. Uh, and these all can lead to confusion, falls, hip fractures, and uh, social disability. Beta blockers, a lot of uh, elder patients on beta blockers. Of course, the adverse drug event uh, is a decrease in cardiac output. Beta blockers also cause bradycardia, uh, can uh, uh, exacerbate heart failure, uh, can lead to confusion, falls, and the feeling of being very cold. Uh, DIG. Uh, the uh, adverse drug event is digitoxicity. Uh, digoxin, digitalis, lenoxin, uh, common medications from the, uh, their dig preps. And um, uh, they have to be regulated tightly on patients. They frequently have to have their dig levels drawn every month uh, to see where they're at. They may have to adjust their uh, medication up or down. Uh, and we know this is a medication used to treat atrial fib, which is a common arrhythmia that elder patients are in. Uh, insulin, um, sulfonylureas, uh, uh, acarbose, uh, these are um, blood sugar lowering agents. Uh, so they can lead to hypoglycemia, and of course hypoglycemia can lead to confusion, falls, uh, and head injuries. Uh, narcotics, uh, they may take narcotics, and of course sedation is a uh, adverse drug event. Uh, clinical outcomes include things like uh, constipation, and you could go back to confusion, dizziness, and falls with that as well. Sedative hypnotics cause sedation, but again, issues with, um, they say here, gait disturbances. And they're referring to perhaps like Haldol, uh, Thorazine. You know, those kind of medications are sedative hypnotics, and they can get what are called a, uh, the Haldol shuffle, uh, indicating that, um, you know, they're getting way too much Haldol. Uh, these things, again, all lead to confusion and falls, and again, falls being the number one cause of death in the elderly patient. Uh, as far as pharmacology in the elderly, uh, pharmacokinetics, how these drugs um, work in the body, uh, we know that their absorption is slower because of decreased um, uh, gut mortality, decreased um, uh, distribution of the drugs. Um, they may, because of uh, uh, decreased metabolic rate, have uh, 
uh, increased body mass, decreased lean muscle mass, decreased total body water, um, and as a result, these things will lead to uh, a buildup of medication. And technically, you know, when we learn a dose of a medication, we should cut that in half in patients over the age of 70, although most of us don't do that. Um, so they do require different doses than their younger counterparts. Uh, metabolism. These drugs occur, uh, metabolism of these drugs occur in the liver. And again, depending upon your age and your hepatic blood flow or the presence or absence of hepatic diseases um, can uh, lead to a, a, an increase in the um, circulating amount of the drug in your blood because they aren't, again, metabolized properly. Uh, excretion occurs in the kidneys, and um, that has a lot to do with what's called creatinine clearance. Uh, they'll look at your creatinine clearance, and uh, if it's below a certain amount, um, you're not a candidate for things like um, uh, IV contrast for CTs and uh, those sort of things. They look at your BUN and creatinine. Um, all prescribed medic medicines should be recorded, and I had mentioned earlier a thing called polypharmacy. Uh, and par polypharmacy is a situation where you have a, a patient who takes five or more medications. Some may be over-the-counter, some may be prescription, some may be herbal, um, but they take five or more. And whenever you get into a situation where you have an elder patient taking five or more medications, um, there's a good chance that they could overdose on one of those medications, particularly if they forget whether or not they've taken them. Uh, if they forget whether or not they've taken them, uh, they may double up on their dose that day. And if this occurs multiple days in one week, it's easy for them, especially with decreased renal flow and decreased uh, liver blood flow, uh, to end up toxic on the medications that day um, that they're taking. Uh, another issue, of course, with polypharmacy is uh, uh, pharmacy shopping. If, if, uh, if you go to different pharmacies, there's no guarantee that... Um, when one pharmacist fills a script that they know all the other medications this person's on. Uh, and as a result, they could uh, end up getting two drugs that they take that um, counteract with each other. Okay, so here's the multiple medications in polypharmacy slide. Falls, very common cause of injury. Again, the number one cause of death in the elderly patient. Um, uh, depending on the age, uh, certainly can have poor long-term prognosis with hip fractures. And of course, you all know that a hip fracture is not the pelvis. Uh, hip is referring to the head of the femur. Uh, and when the head of the femur snaps off, that's considered a hip fracture. Uh, and the trauma can be serious from the fall uh, in addition to the hip fracture itself to include things like head injuries. Uh, fall risk factors, so the older you are, the more likely you are to fall, whether or not you're using alcohol, whether or not you have any sort of brain diseases or central nervous system problems. Uh, decreased uh, hearing and decreased vision um, uh, may affect, particularly vision, may affect your uh, ability to, um, to navigate uh, different leveled surfaces, uh, going up a step, down a step, a raise in the sidewalk, that sort of thing. Um, uh, dementia, depression, uh, medications may increase your risk of falls, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, and sensory impairment. And we've already talked about hearing and vision being one of those, or two of those. Uh, some environmental uh, modifications that should occur in the home of an elder patient is to make sure that the uh, furniture is arranged uh, for clear walking paths, make sure that there's adequate lighting and night lights, uh, make sure there are handrails around the tubs, the showers, the toilets, uh, remove clutter, uh, remove throw rugs, or if you uh, leave them, make sure they're, they're taped down. Uh, use non-slip decals in the bathtub to provide, um, uh, or provide a, a shower bench uh, for them to sit on while they're taking a shower. Now, the reason that we even bring this up to you as an EMS provider is that you're in the home. Uh, and as you look around the home for an elder patient that fell, um, you know, look for these things. If they're present, great. If they're not, uh, perhaps a social service um, referral needs to be made so that they can go in and assess the home for fall risk. Um, 
as we old, uh, we all have changes in our sensations. Uh, and these changes can affect our vision, our hearing, our speech, our perception to pain. And the older we get, the more pronounced these uh, changes are. You know, if a person has glasses, uh, make sure that you bring them with. Uh, look at them. Uh, oftentimes they are so dirty, it's a wonder they could even see out of them uh, anyway. So clean their glasses and give them back to them. Some of the vision changes that they might have might include uh, uh, presbyopia, which is the inability to see clearly at close proximity. So needing cheaters or even lights and cheaters or a big magnifying glass with a light might be something they need. Cataracts, of course, are a natural and painless clouding of uh, the eye lens. Uh, and uh, once they do set in, uh, it may affect vision. And they're easily removed uh, with a quick and painless surgery. And uh, they're, they're good to go. Glaucoma are uh, eye disorders, uh, vision loss from damage to the optic nerve caused by an increase in ocular pressure. Um, there are a couple types of glaucoma. There's open angle glaucoma, uh, an angle closure, or acute gl glaucoma. And these can be uh, diagnosed with perhaps uh, pain in the eye and, and issues with uh, vision. And um, uh, any eye doctor can measure the pressure um, um, uh, in the eye to determine whether or not a patient has early signs of glaucoma. Um, you know, this is supposed to illustrate, uh, you know, a, a pretty clear vision at 20 years, a little bit blurry at 40 years, uh, and then um, even more blurry at 60 plus, maybe a, a shade or a, a dimness over everything as well. Uh, hearing. Hearing loss is uh, four times more common than vision loss. Hearing aids go with the patient to the hospital. Uh, hearing aids and other technological devices help to correct hearing deficits. Um, and uh, take caution with hearing aids during uh, spinal immobilization. We often don't think about that, you know, sla slapping the head blocks on, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, be careful with the hearing aids if they're still in. If you do remove them, make sure that you keep them with the patient and... Um, and that uh, it's documented that you did give them to somebody and, and they, uh, they acknowledge that because oftentimes on the back end they're missing their hearing aids and well I had them in the ambulance but they didn't leave them and now they lost them and uh, so the ambulance ends up paying for them. Speech impairments, uh, speech, uh, they end up with impairments in verbal communication. It can be caused by a variety of conditions. Um, you know, whether it be a uh, stroke or, um, you know, something that affects the muscles of the mouth and the ability to uh, form words. Um, and in those situations when we're dealing with an elder patient who has difficulty expressing themselves, uh, we need to express compassion, not impatience. Uh, it's frustrating. It is for us. It's extremely frustrating for the patient, especially if they know what they want to say and they're having trouble saying it. So they may, they may need some little extra time to communicate compared to younger patients. Uh, incontinence is something else that you'll see in elder patient, and that's the inability to control excretory functions. Um, it is never considered normal. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, when a person is incontinent of urine or stool, um, that can often be a sign of a disease process. It's not a normal finding. Uh, we see it a lot in elderly, but it isn't normal. Uh, it's not, oh, well, they're incontinent just because they're old. Remember, it's probably part of a, a disease process. Um, sudden onset with back pain um, and incontinence certainly is a, a, a perhaps a, a spinal cord compression, which, which would require an emergency evaluation at a hospital. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, being incontinent of urine and stool uh, frequently uh, can cripple a person's self-esteem and, and uh, uh, their social lives as well. Um, continent reasons it might occur. Um, 
some sort of a significant anatomic anomaly, anomaly in the uh, gastrointestinal or genitourinary tract. Um, normally, we have a, a competent, what's called a competent sphincter to stop excretory uh, function uh, adequately when it's closed. Uh, but in um, you know in patients, um, you know that uh, sphincter may become incompetent, uh, allowing for what you may hear in the uh, medical uh, realm as uh, uh, anal leakage. Uh, you even get that in certain medications will cause that as as well. Um, uh, People understand that they have difficulty controlling um, or withholding uh, this excretion, um, and uh, they they just can't. It's not something that they can control. Um, they may work at uh, motivating to remain continent. Uh, forcing themselves to not have the incontinence until they're in an appropriate place to, to go to the bathroom. Uh, and that can be just as damaging on a person as um, not practicing good bowel habits and going when you feel a need to go. Uh, they may have the inability to urinate as well. Uh, this can be the result of a decrease in urine production, and that's all related to kidney function. Um, there are medications that will cause urinary retention. Uh, they may have an obstruction of the genital urinary tract. Um, if their bladder is distended in full <coughs> and easily palpable, and of course they're going to be in extreme pain with a, a full bladder and they can't urinate, that would suggest an issue with medications or, or perhaps an obstruction. Constipation. Um, Constipation is defined as less than one bowel movement every three days. 30% uh, of the population older than 65 years old are chronically constipated. Um, they need to be medically evaluated when they have the complaint of constipation because it could be the result of uh, colorectal cancer, uh, a volvulus, uh, or bowel obstruction. In assessing the elderly patient, uh, it's important that we do exhibit patience because it, it may require a little longer time uh, to get the information from them. Uh, their social history is just as important as their medi medical history. Um, but we also need to get a good sample history on them as well to include all their, their medications. It's also important to note their nutrition and whether they're getting adequate nutrition because uh, some of the changes that affect the elderly uh, also uh, um, affect their, uh, their ability to eat well. You know, things like uh, not dentures that don't fit well, a dry mouth, um, la lack of uh, taste buds. Uh, you know, those things all lead to poor nutrition. Uh, some of the things that may complicate your assessment it includes the uh, elder patient who has uh, chronic diseases uh, or who has a really unusual presentation of a disease. Uh, their decreased sensory functions may make it harder to uh, communicate. Uh, and they, they have a tendency to keep serious symptoms and chronic diseases to themselves. Um, they um, don't want to report these symptoms. Uh, and, you know, probably the biggest reason we guess that occurs uh, is uh, fear that they're not going to be able to come home. You know, if they tell you they have these symptoms, uh, you might find something seriously wrong with them and they may end up in a nursing home or uh, even staying at the hospital and not being able to come home for a while. Um, if their uh, hearing aids are um, not present, uh, or their glasses are not in place, we need to make sure that happens. Uh, we can always use nonverbal clues. Uh, we want to repeat and answer back. Uh, and when we're interviewing these people, speak clearly uh, and slowly uh, in terminology that they can understand. Chest pain and shortness of breath are the two most reasons that elderly patients use EMS. 
and oftentimes they'll have a history of COPD or congestive failure when their shortness of breath is, is reported. Uh, they'll be sitting up. We shouldn't put them supine. Uh, the chest pain uh, is treated as critical until you can rule out whether or not it's STEMI or NSTEMI or unstable angina. Uh, it does require us to get a good OPQRST to determine if the pain or shortness of breath is heart related or not and a uh, thorough physical exam to include assessment of mental status is important because one of the first things to go in a person who is in early signs of shock uh, is mental status. Some transport patients uh, challenges include uh, we want to certainly prevent falls when we're moving the patient to and from the stretcher. Uh, we may have to provide extra padding. Um, they may be incontinent uh, on the cot on the way to the hospital and um, you know you're just going to have to help them maintain their dignity uh, convey to them that this uh, happens frequently and it's nothing to be ashamed about um, some other management considerations include uh, the unique challenges that you see with uh, elder patients airways uh, it's important that we secure a patent airway um, if intubation is needed uh, you know, looking for uh, false teeth. If their false teeth are good and solid and in there, uh, it's often better to leave them in because it's easier to mask the patient when you uh, use your bag valve mask. Um, if uh, if that uh, isn't possible because their teeth are loose, you need to remove them. Uh, you may have to excuse me. You may have to pad their shoulders in order to get their head to drop back so that you can get a good visual of their of their airway but we need to resuscitate their uh, their airway and their, its patency aggressively uh, some pulmonary changes in the elderly all systems are affected by the aging process including the pulmonary system the uh, strength in the respiratory muscles decreases and as a result it's very difficult for them to uh, to work hard at breathing um, the elasticity of the lungs and chest wall decreases, uh, so it's uh, it's harder for them to take a deep breath. Uh, it's harder for them their their tidal volume actually decreases. Um, they may have a history of pulmonary disease, and when we listen to their lungs, crackles would suggest pulmonary edema because you're going to hear them all across the bases, where focal sounds might suggest pneumonia. In other words, if you're hearing uh, uh, if you're hearing um, crackles or uh, even ronchi in the uh, upper right lobe. Well, that's typically not um, pulmonary edema from uh, things like congestive failure. That's typically pneumonia. Uh, pulmonary changes in the elderly, we're going to manage them by giving them oxygen, keep their SATs above 95%. If we're not able to get their SATs above 95%, <sighs> excuse me, <clears throat> we may have to um, provide positive pressure into base, uh, positive pressure ventilation. I don't know why it says intubation there, but positive pressure ventilation, um, CPAP. Uh, if we're unsuccessful, then we might need to consider some sort of rapid sequence airway, whether it be endotracheal tube or King or uh, an LMA. Um, uh, beta agonists uh, perform uh, minimal risk in these patients, so if they're having trouble breathing by evidence of wheezing, you could give a breathing treatment. And uh, Lasix is no longer recommended for pulmonary edema because it can worsen dehydration as well as cause other problems. And these patients usually have to be upright sitting when being transported. Pneumonia is the leading cause of infection in the elderly. It's the fifth leading cause of death uh, in uh, all of society, and it's commonly caused by a bacteria. Uh, some risk, fa risk factors include a person who has difficulty swallowing, um, their weak cough causes an increased risk of aspiration, their decrease in their immune system, as well as their decrease in pulmonary function to fight off early infection in the lungs all make them at higher risk of pneumonia. Uh, your physical exam, there should be a cough, there should be a fever, but it may not be present. Uh, there should be shorter breath, tachypnea, hypoxic, um, uh, you know, lungs uh, may uh, have uh, crackles in different lobes. 
Um, treatment is to administer oxygen uh, and improve uh, improve oxygenation and ventilation. So improve both those things. So treatment is aimed at giving them oxygen and improving their ventilation if you need to. Uh, IV fluids uh, aren't really necessary. Certainly establishing an IV would be okay. Uh, they're going to need need it to give the uh, antibiotics once they get to the ED. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that includes chronic bronchitis, emphysema, uh, asthma, uh, uh, bronchiolitis, you know, those sort of things. Now, when a person, excuse me, when a person has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, typically they have both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Uh, it's not likely that they have just one. They can, but it, more than likely they have a combination of both. They have emphysema uh, from uh, years of smoking uh, as well as uh, chronic bronchitis. Um, it's important to know the history of prior intubations and the last time they had oral steroid use. You know, if a person has a history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and they've been intubated on a ventilator in the last year and you're picking them up and they're really sick again, well, chances are they're going to end up on a ventilator again. Uh, listen for breast sounds. The absence or minimal breast sounds could be really misleading in a person with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, if they're clamped down tight, they may not be moving much air. Uh, doesn't mean they have a spontaneous pneumothorax. It could be that they're just not moving enough air. Uh, you can give them uh, oxygen and, and a breathing treatment to help open up those bronchioles and see if you can't hear better uh, breath sounds. Now, pulmonary embolism is, is very difficult to diagnose in the field. <coughs> Probably the, uh, the biggest clue that we're going to have is something called ventilation perfusion mismatch. If you assess their um, ventilations, uh, in other words, their lungs are clear, um, their breathing is uh, normal, maybe increased a bit, um, uh, the, the dynamics of breathing are all present, you've got good chest rise and fall, good flattening of the diaphragm, no holes in the chest, all that sort of stuff. Um, so you know ventilation is good. Uh, and perfusion, their blood pressure is good, their pink warm moist, their uh, capri fill is good, uh, they've got, you know, good strong peripheral pulses. Then you know that, uh, well, I got my perfusion's good and my ventilation's good, but why are my sats poor? Something is obstructing the oxygen from getting into the bloodstream. Uh, patients with pulmonary emboli may have pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, they may be tachypneic, uh, maybe coughing up blood. Um, risk factors include recent surgery or trauma, immobilization, history of DVTs, uh, or if they're in a hypercoagulable state. Uh, treatment is supportive, IV fluids, and uh, we don't give anticoagulant drugs in the field, uh, but certainly on diagnosis of a pulmonary embolus, uh, they may give anticoagulants and, and um, uh, in some places uh, anti. Um, they may be giving fibrinolytics with known uh, pulmonary emboli. Uh, the large arteries become less elastic and more rigid, and this causes uh, pressure in the arterial system during systole, uh, which increases systolic pressure and leads to a widening pulse pressure. The systolic and the diastolic get farther apart. Um, some peripheral vascular changes. Uh, they get an increase in peripheral vascular resistance, uh, so that means an increase in diastolic blood pressure uh, and an increase in mean arterial pressure. And that can be a good thing since circulation is, uh, can be an issue with uh, elder patients. Uh, but uh, they're at risk for things like atherosclerotic disease, um, MIs, uh, STEMI and STEMIs, uh, stroke, uh, limb ischemia, mesenteric ischemia as well, uh, and uh, uh, certainly um, um, decreased blood flow to the kidneys. Uh, the left ventricle thickens as, the, as we get older, and hypertension requires the heart to pump against higher pressures. So that left heart works so much harder when you have a high blood pressure 
leading to left ventricular hypertrophy, and we talked on a 12 lead ECG how you could pick that out. Um, you decrease uh, capability to respond to beta adrenergic stimulation. Uh, blood vessels don't contract well. Uh, lack of uh, venous blood return. Um, and uh, as a result, you're going to be more prone to uh, postural or orthostatic hypotension. As far as the history goes, uh, try to obtain a sense of their cardiovascular fitness when interviewing an elder patient. You know, any recent changes in exertional tolerance, any diet changes, uh, do they smoke, any shortness of breath, palpitations, what sort of medications they use, all those things will help you with your cardiac history. Uh, as far as your physical exam in a heart patient, you want to look at, listen to the heart, you want to listen to the lungs, you want to look at the peripheral vascular system. Uh, you want to check pulses in all extremities and look for um, uh, pedal edema or sac pedal or sacral edema uh, and also look for signs of dehydration. Uh, management in uh, cardiovascular emergencies is to of course maintain the blood pressure at least above 90. Uh, oxygen, um, uh, maintain a patent airway, adequate ventilation, adequate oxygenation, uh, adequate blood pressure. Uh, medications, again, we should give in half doses, but uh, I don't know many people that do that. They just take the adult dose and, and give it to the elder patient. Myocardial infarction is a uh, coronary artery disease is the most common cardiovascular disease in the elderly. So as we age, our uh, coronary arteries uh, become um, narrowed with this uh, gruel or paste. Uh, made up of lipids and fats and proteins and calciums and all kinds of things. And in a patient with an MI, uh, particularly left heart failure, they're going to develop acute pulmonary edema, so shortness of breath is a very common complaint associated with MI. Um, some risk factors, the older you are, uh, if you're uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, known heart disease, if you're already taking aspirin or beta blockers, um, treatment, sooner the better. Um, uh, let's see. When, a, when treating a elder patient with um, heart disease, we need to be just as aggressive as we do in, in younger people. Um, we know that those patients uh, perhaps suffering uh, heart attacks, um, whether they be STEMI or NSTEMI or unstable angina, uh, we want to give them um, you know, oxygen, aspirin, nitroglycerin, morphine, those sort of things. CHF, <coughs> the incident increases as we age. Uh, it manifests initially as vague symptoms like weakness, shortness of breath, can't breathe while you're lying flat, uh, cough, uh, lower extremity edema, crackles in the bases. Um, if the heart failure is isolated just to the right side, then when the right side of the heart fails, blood backs up into the periphery. So we can get uh, pedal and sacral edema, we can get abdominal ascites, um, we're not going to have any pulmonary symptoms, but uh, we can see an enlargement of the liver uh, as well. Um, and I mentioned jugular vein distension. Um, in patients with right heart disease, uh, you know, if they're hypertensive, you might consider nitrates. If they're having a heart attack, you might consider uh, nitrates. Um, but uh, understand that giving a um, the right ventricle is very susceptible to decreases in preload. So if we give a medication that's going to drop preload, uh, it's really going to bottom your blood pressure out. So we want to be very cautious giving nitrates in right heart failure. Um, and you can tell that when you hook somebody up to a 12 lead ECG and you see elevated ST segments in 2, 3, and AVF. Uh, in about 25% of those patients, it's going to be the right ventricle. So you pick that right V4 up, move it, move it over to the the same place, only on the right side, rerun your 12 lead ECG and mark um, V4 as a right V4, 
And if you've got elevated ST segments, even of one small box, then that's indicative of a right ventricular um, involvement, and you'd want to um, avoid nitrates until you gave them fluid boluses. Uh, also, avoid diuretics in the field. We just we just don't give Lasix in the field uh, anymore for congestive failure. Dysrhythmias are common in the elderly as well, and their prevalence increases as they age, with atrial fib being the most common type of presenting arrhythmia in the elderly. And it's caused by structural heart disease, heart failure, hypertension, valvular abnormalities, thyroid disorders, recent heart surgery, severe infections, and metabolic disturbances can all cause AFib. Um, there are other uh, uh, dysrhythmias that you can see in the elder population, sick sinus syndrome, sinus arrhythmia, PVCs, um, syncope, uh, and we have a person who has a syncopal episode. Uh, it's important that we, you know, we do further investigation. Uh, if it is simple vasovagal syncope, it'll correct itself quickly and they'll be okay. But if they still remain lightheaded or dizzy five minutes later or so, we need to investigate that to make sure that it's not being caused by an arrhythmia. Um, if a person has fallen, you know, search for the cause of the fall. Did they fall because they had an arrhythmia that led to a low blood pressure? Ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and SVT uh, are common arrhythmias seen in the elderly, and we're just going to follow the ACLS guidelines. Uh, aneurysms, uh, they can be uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, and they do increase with age. Uh, when they do rupture, they carry an 80% mortality rate, and the number one risk factor is hypertension. Uh, certainly, uh, smoking and atherosclerosis leads to the advancement of the disease, uh, but the aneurysm is actually caused by hypertension. Symptoms include abdominal or flank and back pain. Um, you know, look for palpable masses in the abdomen. Uh, check for pulses in the lower extremity. Um, treatment is going to be aimed at uh, not rupturing the aneurysm. Uh, so if the aneurysm is caused by hypertension, we may need to start an IV and lower that blood pressure. Uh, but we don't want to lower it so much that we cause a rebound hypertension, or a rebound um, yeah, a rebound hypertension um, as the body responds to compensate for the drop in blood pressure. Hypertension uh, is seen in over 50% of Americans, uh, geriatric Americans. Uh, causes of hypertension include diabetes and obesity. Um, hypertension causes kidney damage and end organ damage. Um, the United States uh, is uh, seeing a, a huge outbreak in uh, diabetes related specifically to obesity. Uh, hypertensive emergencies uh, can lead to um, end organ dysfunction, chest pain, vision changes, mental status changes, vomiting, urinary complaints, and uh, bloody noses. Uh, you know, that person who has a bloody nose should be able to quickly stop it with several minutes of pressure. But if they're having difficulty stopping the hemorrhage, then you might want to think that they're hypertensive. As far as neurology goes, we're talking about strokes and those sort of things that happen in the brain. Uh, get a good history. Remain calm and clear. Allow them time to respond. Uh, note any mental status changes. Uh, find out if they've had any recent changes in uh, behavior. Um, stroke may... Uh, or neurologic problems may limit their ability to perform uh, activities of daily living. Uh, try to get a feel for the patient's mood. Um, if they can't communicate, do understand that they can hear and they can see and they know what's going on. They just may not be able to communicate because of uh, the stroke. Okay. Uh, strokes is a sudden change in neurologic function caused by an alteration in cerebral blood flow. The alteration could be uh, the result of an ischemic stroke uh, where blood flow in one of the arteries in the brain is blocked. Uh, ischemic strokes make up about 82% of all strokes um, and they may be a thrombus or an embolus. 
Uh, a thrombus is a clot that slowly forms in the vessel, or an embolus is a clot that forms somewhere outside the brain, uh, breaks free, travels, and gets lodged in the uh, brain. Uh, fortunately, um, uh, when we talk about strokes, the good news is that 80-some percent are ischemic, uh, with most of them being embolic. And the embolus could be a blood clot, it could be a chunk of fat, it could be an air embolism, it could be amniotic fluid in the pregnant uh, patient, uh, or it could be a foreign body um, uh, as well in the vessel that gets lodged, obstructing the blood flow. And you can see this with uh, catheter tips that break off inside the vessel, those sort of things. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke is the other type of stroke. You've got ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. And hemorrhagic strokes are caused by an aneurysm or a rupture of a uh, weakening uh, wall in the uh, ar artery. Um, and the number one cause of uh, uh, hemorrhagic strokes is hypertension again. Um, TIAs, transient ischemic attack, it's uh, the very same disease process as a CVA, um, but once it's resolved, uh, the patient typically returns to a baseline within 24 hours. So the World Health Organization defines a a TIA is stroke-like symptoms that resolve in 24 hours. The American Heart Association defines a TIA as stroke-like symptoms that resolve in 24 minutes. Uh, the importance of seeing a CVA uh, is that uh, some of those patients, uh, depending on their lifestyles, uh, may develop a major stroke within the next six months. Risk factors for um, uh, cerebrovascular disease include hypertension, smoking, diabetes, uh, atrial fibs, uh, and uh, narrowed uh, carotids. Treatment includes uh, ABCs, get a good uh, medication uh, history and a good medical exam, get a blood glucose level for all altered mental statuses, uh, do a fast G, that's where we're looking for facial droop, arm drift, slurred speech, and time. And the G stands for glucose, so we can see whether or not this um, this uh, patient is um, uh, having a low blood glucose, which is a, a common mimicker of stroke. Uh, MEND refers to the myel Miami Emergency Neurologic um, uh, Diagnostic Exam, and uh, uh, that exam is something that we certainly can teach you in one of the labs coming up. Uh, it's something that is being taught across the state. It's something that is being used, um, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a good way to check and catch those types of strokes that are not covered with the Cincinnati Paraspal Stroke Scale or the FAST G where we look for facial droop, arm drift, slurred speech, and time of onset. Um, uh, that sort of assessment, the Cincinnati Paraspal Stroke Scale, uh, only looks at left and right hemispheric strokes. So it's very difficult for us to pick up things like um, cerebellar strokes, uh, brain stem strokes, uh, and uh, this additional MEND exam done en route to the hospital may help us pick those out. Uh, regardless, <clears throat> if you think you're dealing with a stroke because we don't have a CT scanner, uh, it is not recommended that we give aspirin. Uh, dementia is a decline in intellectual functioning. It's a memory deficit. It occurs over an extended period of time. Uh, so dementia is a progressive thing that, once diagnosed, only gets worse uh, and uh, does not have a cure. Uh, <coughs> causes, uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, vascular dementia, uh, brain tumors, uh, CNS trauma, uh, HIV uh, dementia. Uh, here they're saying there are some that may have reversible causes, a vitamin deficiency, an infection like a meningitis, um, or a normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, may cause uh, dementia and lowering the um, the intracranial pressure uh, improves the dementia. Delirium is uh, an acute onset. Uh, it's often reversible. It has a cause. Uh, it can be intermittent. Uh, it's a global disorder of cognition and consciousness and it may be accompanied by emotional or psychomotor disturbances as well. Uh, the number one cause of delirium in the elder population uh, is um, uh, 
urinary tract infection. So, causes of delirium, acid-based disturbances, acute blood loss, anemia will cause delirium, acute MI, psychosis, abnormally amounts of, uh, large amounts of um, nitrogenous waste in the blood, uh, congestive heart failure, delayed cardiac output, dehydration, uh, electrolyte abnormalities, fecal impaction, urinary tract infections, uh, abnormally high uh, CO2 levels, uh, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. And all these things are correctable. And if we were to correct them, uh, then the delirium would clear up. Uh, hypothermia, hyperthermia, hypoxia, infections, intoxication, medications, metabolic disorders, all these things, again, uh, are causes of delirium with urinary tract infection being the number one cause. All right, so with that, we've uh, wrapped up the first part of uh, Chapter 38 on geriatrics. And um, uh, I'm going to break it up into two parts because of the length of the lecture. Uh, so I'll uh, be talking to you soon.